Um, so yeah, songwriting, right? This is songwriting. How many of you guys are songwriters? Everyone in the frickin' room better raise your hand. <laughs> songs, huh? Especially for the church. We get to put words in people's mouths. Sometimes I, I think about that, and it's quite a, a weighty privilege, actually. Quite a, quite a weighty gravitas-type deal where um, there's, a, there's a lot of importance on that, because I think sometimes you can write songs and put the wrong pe- things in people's mouths, and that ain't good. Especially when people get mad at you for using the wrong words. Yeah. <laughs> You never know, man. <laughs> One day I'm going to have a full class just on the emails I've received. Because <laughs> they're so fun. Like, <laughs> they're literally like, hey, do you know what that word means? This is Facebook, always Facebook. Do you know what that word means? And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Why did you use that in a song? <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> I stopped responding a long time ago, but it, for real, it is a it is a really really weighty thing that we get to do. We get to write songs, especially for the church, putting words in people's mouths, in the congregation's mouths. That's a big thing. So obviously, we got to be dialoguing with the Holy Spirit. Anna talked a little bit about that this morning, talking to him about, hey, what what season are we in as a church? What season are we in as a community? What should I be actually? feeding the people in my church? What do we want to say back to God? Those are the questions that I'm often asking um, when I'm going to write a small song, especially if it's for the church. You know, if it's just for me and my wife, then I'm just asking maybe Marvin Gaye what I should write on that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this guy right here, he goes, uh, the biggest eye roll. <laughs> hey girl, un- unacceptable. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'll get emails about that too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really is a, a special thing, though, that we get to do, and so I'm, I'm excited that you guys are coming to learn about songwriting. I think it's one of the most, I don't know, unique privileges that we have in the church is to, to write the songs that people are going to sing. I think about, like, the Beatles back in whatever, 60s, 50s, I don't know, where, when was that? Anybody? 60s. 60s, okay. 1910. My history, <laughs> back, back in the, the 1900s. <laughs> 1900s. <laughs> No, you know, <laughs> all the older folks are mad at me now. I'm going to get emails from them now. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the Jesus movement, and, and the Beatles basically single-handedly wrote the soundtrack to that kind of thing that happened across the earth, and they got to change and shift culture in that time. They basically got to tell people what to believe in that time. And now we, as songwriters, especially for the church, we get to tell people what to believe. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of songs like, what's that? It's the Creed, or uh, what's it actually called? I believe. I believe in God our Father. This I believe. This I believe. Like, I love that song because it's just straight mm-hmm. truth. Yep. There's something really beautiful like about that. I think. Yeah. Um, I is it Hill song? Yeah. What's yeah, the, wasn't there a Newsboys one? They, uh, I believe in God the Father. <laughs> I believe in Jesus Christ. God the Son. God the Son. God the Son. Emails. Lisa, that's why Anna writes all the songs. I just steal it and I don't even put her name on the podcast. It's like, hey, listen, you're going to get more material in heaven from this. Just, I'm not even going to put your name on this. She actually does get up something made up. Um, but we get to, to shift and change culture. We get to tell people what to believe, what to think. And, you know, I'm thinking of so many of the songs that have come out, come out wow, have come out recently, like King of My Heart. I love that song. We did it four clicks too fast last night. I don't know if you guys noticed that. That's why it sucked, though. <laughs> you know, I'm standing there on the stage like, what is wrong with this? Like, what happened? And I look at Caleb, I said, what's that click at? And he goes, 75. And I was like, yeah, it's supposed to be 68. Thanks, bro. <laughs> and he's like, ugh. <laughs> we did it so fast, but the, the theme of that song is the goodness of God. Yeah. I'm thinking of Good, Good Father, obviously, another yeah. song about the goodness of God. Yeah. 
you almost feel the Father breathing on that kind of stuff because he's going, I want to shift the ideology concerning who I am in my people. Because so many of us, we believe that he's mean, disappointed, mad, yep. you know, just up in heaven waiting to smite us with a lightning bolt like the first sin we commit, right? Like, that's, that's what I thought about God for so long. He's just waiting for me to screw up so he can send me to hell. And he's going, I wish that someone would write a song that would get revelation first of who I actually am, and put it in a song so my people could experience that. Yeah. So there's this wave of songs that have come out about the goodness of God, because he's going, I want people to understand that I'm not me. Yeah. I'm not a dictator. I'm not a ruler. I'm not a check the boxes, and then you make it the heaven guy. He's going, I'm kind. Yeah. I'm good, and I want people to experience that. So someone like Sarah McMillan, coupled with her brilliant husband, John, they write that song, King of My Heart. And it begins to actually change the expression of Christianity, I believe, in a generation because yeah. of one song. Yeah. Good, good father, it's one song. Yeah. You know, hopefully reckless love, it's one song. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't like the word reckless, you can get out of my freaking class, okay? <laughs> <laughs> saying, God's like, I'm waiting for someone to actually experience me and pen it in a song. Yeah. Give people language to sing that they've never known before, because my revelation hopefully has become some of y'all's revelation. You're like, oh my gosh, wait a second. He is kind. I used to think of him as mean. I thought of him like my dad was. And now in a moment, it's completely changed. That's good. And I can look at him and go, oh wait. He's, he's actually nice. <laughs> he's actually a good God who is for us, not against us, that type of thing. And so that's always been my goal as a songwriter. I want to give the church language, and I want to give the church new revelation. Yeah. You know, we've all heard um, you know, songs about the cross before. And don't get me wrong, I love the cross. <laughs> I wouldn't be here without the cross. None of us would be. But when you go like, you died upon the cross, Lord, I'm like, I freaking know that. <laughs> like, either give me a new melody, a new progression, there's something that unlocks my heart, or something may maybe that bypasses some of the walls yeah. that are in my heart via the music, or actually give me new language on it. So I think of like, uh, what's that song? Uh, it's, uh, it's a Hillsong song, I think Joel wrote it, something about like, Madness poured out in blood. What what song is that? Here now. Here now. Here now. That song is brilliant. The way that it describes the cross, I was like, oh my gosh, I've I've never thought of the cross like that. Yeah. Like that it was just it was wild. Like it was crazy. Just poured out in blood. He didn't care what it looked like. I was like, whoa, that's Jesus. Arms wide open, bleeding on a cross. That's Jesus. Yeah. So I'm thinking of songs like that that can actually shift someone's understanding. Because someone took the time to get revelation and then give language yeah. to the people in the room to experience it. And that's our job. As songwriters, we get to do that. I mean, that's obviously a weighty thing, but it's a massive privilege as well. So that's always been my goal. I want to let these guys, I'm not going to talk the whole time, sorry. These <laughs> no, guys get some thoughts do. in there Please as well. Talking. And then we'll just jump straight into the q and I'm sure Sean's got that mic just crispy right now. Woo! Just <laughs> all high. <laughs> <laughs> Burn it up. <laughs> so, Moose, talk to us, man. Just yeah. maybe a little of your heart. What are you feeling on that? Yeah. Hey, guys. Man, I just I want to say I'm so so honored to be up here with these guys. And there's there's so many other people on our team. There's such great writers that could yeah. be yeah. in this seat as well. Um, you know, we have Rachel Culver and Anna Asbury and Richard and Sarah, who you just heard. So we're we're really trying to. Hope I didn't forget anybody important. <laughs> <laughs> looking around, I'm like, I write too. <laughs> we have a we have a great team, um, so <laughs> it's honored to be up here with these guys. And um, you know, songwriting is man, it's such a journey for for the musician and the writer. And um, there's there's just such a beautiful journey that is inside. And I, I think what one of the amazing things about it is it's kind of at least for me the journey has been. God's mechanism of unlocking my heart, uh, of, of breaking off. Um, you know, I kind of think about it. It's like before I started writing and trying to access those things, it's like my heart was covered in ice or it was covered in stone. Yeah. And then you keep hitting at that, that spot and then it keeps coming back. And, you know, you know writer's block or you, you, 
you know, right rubbish or whatever it is, and, and it's, you know, you can't get there to something that's powerful or has revelation or anointing on it. And then you have that small moment of breakthrough with God, whether it's in the secret place or it's on stage in, in the prayer room or, or whatever kind of way it is. If you're driving in the car, a lot of times it's in the shower. I, who else gets revelation in the shower? Come on. Um, on the toilet. On the toilet for Ryan. <laughs> Um, emails. Yeah, emails for Corey. Um, <laughs> emails for Corey, I agree. Um, but, you know, you have these moments where God, you know, even though you're trying your hardest not to let him get through sometimes, because, you know, we're just, we're human and we're broken, and he gets through, and it's just like a piece of the ice, like a laser beam cuts through, and there's just a little little hole where he can he can reach that spot and your real heart begins to come out and I think that that has been my journey somewhat and I think that a lot of people can can identify with that is we're kind of starting broken and we're working towards wholeness That's good. And, and and peeling back the layers um, to get to the good stuff which is where we you know, have the heart of God, and he's, he's inside of us and it's no longer our, our egos and our insecurities and whatever else it is, hiding that. Yeah. And then the sooner we get to that stuff, the sooner we write great songs that change the world, <laughs> truly. I, I believe that. Not, not just, you know, songs that are big for whatever reason or, or make a lot of money or have radio, but songs that actually change the hearts yeah. of, of sons and daughters that That's are in the so church. So, yeah. mm. <laughs> It's a sweaty microphone, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I'll just echo Adam to what they're saying, but that's all amazing. Um, we do have a lot of great worship songwriters and, and regular songwriters here at Radiant, and I'm just honored to be with these guys. Um, and there's a lot in this room, too. Like, there's a lot of great songwriters in this room. And some of you might not even know it yet. You might be like, I'm a horrible, I'm a rubbish songwriter, but there's stuff that God has in you that needs to be released. Yeah. There's songs that have yet to be written that are going to be released through you. And um, you have to believe it. <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe that, but you guys need to believe that and actually step into that. And just to echo even what Corey was saying, just the value and the importance of the songwriter. I, we can't stress it enough. Like, there is... I mean, all of history has been changed by music, and it wasn't just because of, like, something that was, you know, one person sang a melody and it just was caught. It was like people sat down and composed and wrote music, and it shifted history. Um, I mean, David taught an entire nation how to love God, and he did it through the songs. Mm -hmm. That's why we have mm -hmm. those, those books. And there was actually more songs that were not recorded in our Bible. Oh. <laughs> you got a song on it. So, like, he taught an entire nation how to love God, and they do it perfectly, but he taught them how to love God through singing. And, um, and all throughout history, that's what the Lord's done, and the Lord has designed it that way. He actually made us. It's because we're actually designed by God in a way where music, so Corey said, it bypasses, it can bypass our intellect and our mind and go right to our spirit. Yeah. And so it's why it's glorious, but it's also dangerous too. Because a lot of times, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a no secular music guy or whatever. But there's stuff that maybe we shouldn't be listening to, whether it's sec secular or Christian, <laughs> where it's like bypassing our, you know, reckless love. <laughs> I wasn't talking about Corey's song, um, <laughs> Corey Caleb's song, um, but it can bypass our intellect and actually. We believe it without even like giving it a thought. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's glorious in the sense that we could actually, we're actually, there's a, I always say, we're as worship leaders we're, and songwriters specifically, we're teachers. Whether you're on stage or not, if you're writing a song and people are singing it, you're actually teaching the body of Christ. Yeah. Who God is. Good, man. And that revelation, like, if so you get revelation, you can actually declare that in a song, people will start singing it. That's what they're going to leave Sunday morning with. Like, I, I love great preaching, and I, like, Pastor Lee's one of my favorite preachers, but on any Sunday, even with the best preacher, you might remember, like, point two sub, you know, like, B of that, of that sermon. That might be your walk away, but you'll be singing Reckless Love for the next month over yourself. You'll be singing about the, the, the wild love of God that just chases you down, right? Or you'll be singing about how good God is, He is the king of your heart. You'll be singing that for the next year, 
because of someone singing on a Sunday morning or you're hearing on the radio or whatever, uh, or on YouTube. Um, but you're listening to this music, it's, it's, it's actually gaining entrance into your heart and it's actually, it's actually taking root and the truth of who God is is actually taking root. That revelation that the songwriter had is re- released and it's bypassing your mind and you're actually going right to your spirit. And your mind catches up eventually. <laughs> but you actually get this amazing like, reality that the songwriters are the teachers of our generation. Yeah, that's right. And actually of all generations. The songwriters are the ones that can turn a country, you know, and, and turn, a, turn a generation to the Lord. So yeah. I just want you guys to understand the value and the importance of, of that. And that you guys, the value and the ability and the importance of, of you as songwriters. Yeah. Like, and you are songwriters, so half of you raise your hands. You, all of you are songwriters if you're in this room. And if you've ever even, like, you know, tried to write a song, you're a songwriter. Just step into it, own it, and, yeah, go after it. That's good, man. Amen. Good. Um, Q, you yeah, get some cues? Here's your questions. Questions? We, you got cues, we got A's. We got A's, baby. So <laughs> <laughs> <what> it is. <laughs> we got A's for your cues, man. I always said it. Salina. <laughs> Hi. Oh, also tell us your name and where you're from, just because we're curious. Okay, I'm Sherilyn. I am from Central Square with Life Church. Nice. Yes. Where is Central Square? What's Central Square? Central Square, New York. Okay. Yes. Oh. Yeah, so Caleb's family's church. Nice. Yeah, I'm their worship leader. That's insane, wow. Yeah, Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. So cool. Um, I was actually at the DWI um, thing that you were at a month ago as well. Where was it? Uh, Florida. Orlando, Florida. The Deeper Worship Intensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Um, so I struggled with something very interesting where I've been a songwriter, but I've always written specifically more for the art of it. Um, and to feel like it is in this specific area and molds, and I'm having a hard time crossing it over into what I feel like the expectations are for congregational worship. Yeah. So like... Your verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus structure, mm-hmm. and also the simplicity of what a volunteer band needs to be able to play something. Yeah. And I have such a love for the art of it and the poetry behind it that I'm having a hard time marrying those things together to make a good song for the congregational worship. Yeah. You want to say something on that? So help. <laughs> yeah, please, please. I think that I think that's what one of the cool things I've seen in the last like five years is that a lot of the formula of like a good worship song or a good Christian song is kind of gone out the window. Um, where there's almost like no... I've seen it toward this... I mean, there's some great worship songs that are just A, B, A. And it's like three choruses, or you see and these three choruses put together. I mean, there's Power in the Name of Jesus is like one of those songs, you know? Um, there's probably another like five that you could think of off the top of your head, but I need to have a pursuit song. <laughs> really, it's like a lot of the night pursuit songs are like that. Um, yeah. But they're powerful songs, and it's made it to where those aren't hard songs to play. Yeah. Like those aren't like the most intense songs to play. But um, I think in some ways, a lot of the old like it has to be really easy. And I mean, the skill level in music has gone up. At least I've seen in volunteers a lot more in the last five years as well because of the accessibility of free classes online, YouTube, all that stuff. But also at the same time, all the like. I feel like all the formula has gone through the window because if a song's good, it just goes. It just travels, and it doesn't matter if there's a big, like, ministry or label promoting it. Yeah. It's like, if a song has life on it, it's just going to go. That's what happened with, you know, the first one I remember was, you know, uh, He Loves Us. Like, mm-hmm. it was like, that did not fit the model. Like, the words are too poetic in a verse. If you ask anyone in Nashville back then, they would have been like, this song will never be on the radio. <laughs> And it's, you're crazy to think that this would be a good single. And yet, that was like a hit single and like a song that really, really broke open yeah. before there was anyone like pushing that song. Uh, and you guys have anything to sound that? Yeah. I'm sure you do. Yeah, I think, I think people don't know as much as we think they do. Like in terms of people that are making those rules about the boundaries and stuff and what you can't cross. Like... I think we kind of make that up in our heads a little bit sometimes. Like, I know that I do that. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll have an idea that, like, I, I felt was from the Lord or whatever, and I'll just be like, no, I can't, can't do it because nobody will sing it. You know, like, that, that's just weird thing that we've kind of got in our head. Nobody's going to sing it. 
you know, it, it's to this, it's to that, and, and the how he loves thing, I think, is a good, it basically, if, if it's a good song, it's a good song. Like, that, that's what it comes down to. If it sucks, it sucks. If it's good, it's good. People will sing it if it's good, and they won't. If it's bad, and you'll find out when you try and leave it. Because <laughs> um, trust me, you've always been there. <laughs> and that, though there were times when I followed all of those little rules that we put on worship music. Like, I followed every single one. Like, I'm just going to write, like, a good song. You know what I mean? I'm going to go intro, verse, chorus, turn around, verse, chorus, bridge, double chorus. Like, I'm going to hit everything in that. Ten. And it'll work. Oh, yeah, tag to it. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's going to go up a few notes on the chorus. It's going to be down a little bit on the verse. The bridge is going to do a chord. I mean, I've, all those things, right, with those typical things we have in our head. And, and there's times where that stuff happens and it doesn't work. It's because if the song's not good, it's not good. And I think we know internally. And I think when we take off a little bit of that cloak that i do not sure where it came from that's kind of over worship music right now, but I think when we can kind of transcend and get out of that, I think the good, the goodies come out. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. Yeah, both those answers are really good. I, I love breaking rules. I freaking hate rules. I feel like I live to break them. Like, I come up to a stop sign. Like, nah, like, nah. What's the purpose of the stop sign? I always ask myself, why is this here? <laughs> yeah, I just I love just kicking rules out of the way. I love what both of these guys said. You know, you think about the hymns back in the day; they were just all verses. There was never a chorus. For bar tunes. Yeah, like it, some of them were those Irish. Now Chris Tomlin just adds a chorus to all of them. Sweetest guy in the world. Um, <laughs> you know, but the only reason we added chorus to those is to give them dynamics. Because yeah. in our day and age, like, if you just go through three verses, everyone in the room is just like, <laughs> you know, everyone's bored. So we, we added a chorus to create dynamics. To me, it's what's, um, what's easy for the congregation. I am thinking of those things. However, I don't uh, like dumbing people down. And especially in the church, like, we think, well, if it's not in a five-note range, and it's not really easy to sing, they're just not going to sing. That's not true. That's not People true. with passion are going to sing what they feel passionately oh, about. Yeah. If you go to a U2 concert, and you say, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Like, it's way out of everyone's range, but they're you better believe they're all like, I still <laughs> Because they feel passionately so about true. it. And most of them are terrible singers. Yeah. Like most people in the world are not proficient singers, you know. But they are going to sing what they want to sing. Yeah, yeah. And so the idea that they can only sing like in a guy range from C all the way up to A E is like, no, that's not even, that's not real. People are going to sing what they feel. Um, so I like, I like to kick that one out of the way, but I still want to make the melody easily accessible, meaning it's easy to remember, the meter yeah, is clear and concise, you yeah. know, if you sing a long, amorphous note arrhythmically with nothing to it, people don't know how to reproduce that, yeah. you know, like if I'm like, oh, <laughs> 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 it's like, keep going, you'd be like, I don't know how to like do that. Right. It doesn't make any sense, but give them some rhythm, like, give them some meter note. to follow, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I know where that note comes in, I know where that drops, and just make it easy on the congregation, yeah. I think, you know, like, you don't have to follow rules, yeah. but make sure that people can reproduce the sounds that you're making, obviously, and I, I'm sure you're thinking of that, yeah. but, you know, I'm thinking of songs like Ryan was mentioning, like, Surrounded, that he did this morning, I actually didn't love the whole version, and I don't know if anyone else is with me, but, like, I'd never heard the full version, yeah. But I'll tell you what, when you go into Surrounded from Standing Your Love, it freaking rules. Yeah. Like, there's something about just the A, B section, yeah. like Ryan was saying, like, uh, what is it? What's the two parts of the song? It may look like, it may look like I'm Surrounded. This and is this is how I find my balance. Yeah. Those two parts, they just rule no matter what. Yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking of, like, the Beatles' Hey Jude. Hey Jude. Like, there's only two parts to that song, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. 
Most of their songs were that way. Yeah. But people could sing them and they loved them. And totally. who cares whether there was verse, chorus, bridge, tag? Like, yeah. it didn't matter. Yeah. I remember Nirvana wrote a song called Verse. <laughs> I think it's literally called Verse, Chorus, Verse, Verse, Chorus, or something like that. <laughs> Just to make fun of the establishment to say, like, it doesn't have to look like this. Radio wants it to look like that because they want it under four minutes. The church, who cares? If it's, if it's three verses and then one quick tag or chorus, it doesn't matter. Like, I so love good. throwing all of that out and just going, Lord, what are you breathing on? Yeah. Yeah. What are people responding to? Can they sing this? Can they reproduce this? Is it easy and does it carry revelation? Yeah. Those, to me, are the most important things. And I love poetry. Like, like uh, Ryan referenced John Mark's song. It's powerful. It's ridiculously powerful. Like, it's really gorgeous. And whether you're a sloppy wet kiss or an unforeseen kiss, like, who cares? <laughs> sloppy wet. Yeah, I'm all for sloppy wet. Sloppy wet. wet. You better believe it's going to be sloppy wet when it you was come foreseen. back. It's going to be gnarly, dude, you know? <laughs> yeah, and we will have foreseen it for three and a half years, beloved. Get your ass in college again. <laughs> you know, it's like... I just hate rules so much. And I love that you asked that question off the top because I remember looking at Reckless Love as an example and thinking, like, the verse is kind of tough to catch. Like, I sing it weird. I hold notes out too long. Like, for some reason, it just feels right to me. And then someone else leaves it, and I'm like, dude, you're not singing that right at all. <laughs> but who freaking cares? Because they reproduced it, and yeah. the congregation sang with them. It was like, I don't care. Sing it however you want. Just don't replace reckless with perfect. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I remember four, thinking, four. like, it doesn't make sense. Yes, yeah. people thought it was in 4-4-2. Four, four, I remember thinking, like, melodically, some of it doesn't make sense. The meter's kind of a little weird, but it, it broke a lot of rules, and then it also was like a very widely sung song and yeah. the same thing with how he loves same thing with billion. surrounded oh yeah so will i 100 billion times oh my god not quite as popular in the church because it's so wordy i think people are intimidated by it god knows i am i haven't let it once <laughs> but i tell ben great job bro i love it <laughs> but it's like songs like that that break rules i think we are in the time and space of a generation that needs that and that's just yeah. my opinion. You know, yeah. Tomlin might tell you something different, and that's just because his personality is different than mine, and probably all three of ours. Um, but break the rules, break, break the molds. Who cares? What? Just ask God, ask God what He's breathing on, and do that in your church. And if it works, don't apologize for it. You know, who cares? It, I think those are those are beautiful thoughts and beautiful questions that, that we should be wrestling with. Those are the philosophical questions that I love. Not like, well, how do I write a good song, though? Like, you know, like, that's a big question. I, I really love that. Um, next, Sarah, whoever you feel is right. Alina. Randy had a comment. Hi. What's uh, up? Randy, I'm right here in Richland. Nice. So, um, I can probably speak for a lot of people in here since creative people tend to be slightly ADD. Um, I, I sometimes find it difficult. I'll, I'll get it, I'll get a lyric in my head. I'll, I'll get a phrase, and then I won't have music to go with it. Or I'll get a I'll get a, a melody in my head, and then I'll forget the words I just had. So, from your perspective, what 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 have you found is the easiest way to um, jump into a song? Is it is it getting the piano line, the chord structures, the lyrics? Yeah. What what has worked the best yeah. for developing a plan of attack for really nailing something down? Great question. I think all three of us are probably gonna have vastly different answers. <laughs> yeah. For me, it almost starts. It almost always starts with either just a concept, maybe two lines, like you know, one lyric. Uh, or it's just a melodic idea, and I don't. There's nothing else to it, you know. And a lot of times I'll just sing it into my voice memos, whether it's one line or, or one melodic hook or whatever. And then the rest of it is honestly usually just hard work, like just yeah. working my butt off to finish it, and and making sure that I have time on my calendar where I know I'm sitting down to write and finish. You know, like Tuesday at whatever time. I know that I've got two hours blocked out to finish that song, but I think for all three of us, we're all gonna have a different answer for that. Again, for me, it's usually, it's, it's just conceptual. It's like, I have this idea about the atonement, or this idea, whatever it is, or just a quick melodic idea that comes to me and I'll sing it into my phone, 
and then maybe I'll get an idea later. But, you know, again, these guys are going to have different thoughts on that, but it's just making sure to put in the due diligence afterward yeah. to finish it. And I, I remember Brian always says, um, songwriting is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And I think that's true, man. Like, you get that one line or that one idea, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is going to freaking rule. <laughs> And then you go to finish it, and you're like, I hate myself, and I never <laughs> want to do this again. <laughs> and it's just hard work, man. And it's, it's diligence, it's carving out time, and being faithful with that time, not just being like, oh, well, I know Tuesday at 2 p.m. is normally my writing time, but I just feel like eating like 10 donuts today instead. <laughs> Sometimes we do, right? <laughs> but it's, it's being faithful to actually stick with what you've carved out. And I think the Lord does honor that. Yeah. There's something special about that, you know, where he's like, yeah, you're, you're actually putting in the time and the energy. And there, there, there are going to be songs that just like whoosh, drop into your spirit and it's like, oh my gosh, it's done. But for the most part, it's going to be some work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I know, I know for me, just when you were talking about even writing lyrics and music and, you know, which comes first and how does that process work for me? Cause I am definitely ADD and I'm very forgetful. Um, and all of that stuff, basically anything that would make it hard to write a song. Um, so I, what I like to do is I have purposefully set up like instrument stations pretty much everywhere I inhabit. <laughs> so in my house, I have a, a little piano set up. I have a guitar there and we have in the studio here, there's options everywhere. So like I try and make it so any, any time the inspiration strikes that I have an ability to get to it as quick as I can. And yeah. Cool. And when I used to have a, a studio, a home studio, I would have uh, Pro Tools um, sessions that were just designed for, like, create. So I'd have, like, somebody trying to get in? Betty and Pearl, I think. Oh, Betty and Pearl. <laughs> Definitely Pearl. <laughs> um, I, I had, like, sessions and stuff, you know, and you can do this even if you don't have, like, a home studio, but I would have little creative um, Pro Tools sessions or Logic or GarageBand or whatever you use where I could just open something up and I could start going in on sounds or, or I could record easily. And, and that stuff's really helpful, too. Um, but I think one thing that... Um, pretty much everybody I know that writes does is they just go crazy with the voice memos. Um, pretty much everyone I know that writes does that because it's so, I mean, it's such an easy way. And a lot of the times we, we put um, a lot of rules on what we have to do with that. Like, well, I'm not going to do a voice memo unless like I have this whole thing. And, but totally, a lot of the times I'll just like, I've been in the prayer room, um, you know, over here in the upper room and, and, God will just kind of hit something, or someone will even will sing a melody, and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool melody. And I will just get my little phone out, and I'll be like, <laughs> and then like, and I listen to it later, and it's like terrible, but like the point isn't to have a recording, like an awesome recording to show people. The point is so that I can hear it again, yeah, right. so that when it is time for me to go back later and, and work on it, um, I can. So... There's tons of times where I'll just set my phone on the piano and I'll just play a little melody line or I'll, I'll play a chord progression and, and hum or whatever. And, and that's like, that's huge, that, that stuff. Because if you don't record it, it's gone yeah. forever. I heard um, Jeremy Riddle <laughs> say like, if I don't, at least if I save it in voice memos, it has like a slight chance of like seeing the light of day <laughs> like again. Because if you don't save it somewhere, even just writing it down like is not enough. Like if it's melodic, like you think like you're like, you have this amazing melody that makes the, the word Jesus I love you or something sound amazing. You're like, oh, I would never forget that. Like that makes the phrase Jesus I love you sound totally different and it means so much more now. And then like you come back later and you're like, Oh my gosh! All it is is Jesus. I love you. Like, <laughs> so you gotta you gotta get the you know the melody down if you can. Um, and, and another thing I would say, just in terms of you know what, which is first, is it musical or is it is it lyrics? Um, if you are just a lyricist and you just do melodies and lyrics, having a team around you is so awesome. Um, 
uh, I, I know that for a lot of like pop music, especially nowadays, uh, there's people that they just, they work with their, this specific team and they just, they've come kind of to grips with their, their shortcomings and their insecurities and, and areas that maybe they're not great at. And there's not a mindset always, I have to do every single last part of this or else it's not, you know, real. It's not genuine. There's, there's something beautiful about joining with people and, um, you know, this guy's good at this, guy's, this guy's good at this, and they help me, they make me better. Um, so yeah, I, I have some people that are like that for sure. Like, I, I feel that way about um, Anna Asbury. She, she makes me feel when I'm writing like I, I can go a little further. And then there's some people that I, that I write, what, have written with, and I'm like, hey, I don't know, <laughs> this is very good. It's a condo, he sucks. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Um, no, I, I, same thing. Voice memos. Um, I think everyone. It goes back to what you know, what uh, Lee said last night. Just kind of figuring out how God made you, and like what, how you operate at optimum, you know, in your optimum way. Um, but I've had both. I've had sometimes I get the melody first, and sometimes I get the lyric. Um, but I, I think the team, having people that you co-write with, is like crucial. Um, it just makes it so much, honestly, it makes it so much more enjoyable, and I guess it can be unenjoyable, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it actually, when, I, when I've done it and I go into those times, especially if I go to those times with open hands, like I've had times, I've, I, had a, I had that line where I thought it was like, I Jesus, I love you, and it's like the perfect melody, and they're like, and I thought it was, those two things couldn't be separated, and they were like, actually, I like the, I like the melody, but can we drop the lyric? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> but but when I, every time I've done that, I actually, I've ended up liking or loving the, the song more than it was before, because it actually takes, and once it takes its own form, it actually, in some ways, does go further than you could take it yourself, because it's not just something that you created, you actually brought a team of people together and essentially humble yourselves to work together mm. and make it, you know, make it beautiful. Mm. And so every time I've done that, it's actually been really, really fruitful. Um, sometimes it doesn't work for other people, I guess. But. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next question. At what point do you guys bring in um, co-writers? Do you try to get like um, some structure to the song and then have them edit it and be like, that sucks, this is really good, and just kind of form it act together after that? Or do you just come with the um, melody that you have and the lyrics that you have, like a chorus or something like that, and say, hey, can you build on this? How does that look? Yeah. What a great speaking voice you have. Yeah, that was incredible. Oh, nice. Had a gravel. Yeah, a real nice grass stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Where do we know you from? Orlando? Florida? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I knew. Orlando. The right. Lorenzes? Yes, yeah. okay, okay. There's some people that just sound, like their speaking voice sounds like they can sing. Yeah. yeah. Like when I hear you talk, I'm like, I bet you she was she singing, singing good. Really good. Singing. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo Ritterin is like that. His voice is so low and just kind of... Hello, our front of house guy. And he does have a good voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh crap, I have to say something about that in my car. I think it's um, Oh, I, I can speak to this though. Yeah, go for um, it. With, uh, yeah, with the co-writing thing, I, I think there's a couple different ways. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that coming in when you're writing with someone, it's, it's usually pretty good to have some stuff um, ready. Sections, courses, ideas. But on the flip side of that, there are totally times where you can just get with someone and the vibes are right and you can just create out of thin air, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there, there's, there's seriously both. But I would say with the co-writing thing, I would probably not go into that with not having anything to work on. Because there have been times when I've done that. Um, where I've been like, yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll kind of write, and we'll see what happens, and God's going to breathe on it, and then you just don't go with anything, and then it's like the other person's like, well, I don't really have anything either, and then you kind of start farting around, <laughs> trying to write melodies and lyrics and things like that, and then at the end of it, it's, it's kind of like, oh man, we kind of just wasted a lot of time, um, so there are both, um, but the other side of what you said is, you know, do you need to come in with like a full structure and then bring someone in to pick it apart? Um, I think most of the time when I've co-written, it's when I have a theme, 
like a great chorus or a verse or something, some DNA of the yeah. song yeah. that's just kind of, it's working. Even if it's just like, I don't know what it's going to be, if it's going to be a bridge or a pre-chorus, but it's got this theme, it's got this melody, and it's, it's kind of saying this thing, and I bring someone in to help. Um, hey, do you want to help me see this through? That's usually how, how I've seen it happen. Mm. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> just to play devil's advocate a little bit, I love uh, trying to get all I can done before I bring anybody in. Because to me, I, I do value co-writing. I think it's beautiful. I think the Lord loves family. He loves cohesion. He loves community. He loves unity. All those things. However, sometimes the thing that you're writing about is only endemic or specific to you. Yeah. And it might be a specific experience that you have that someone else might not be able to fully relate with. And for you to get that on paper, or, you know, obviously, I mean that um, figuratively, you know, for you to get that out in some way before you call the SOS for someone else to come in and save you is really valuable because... That's good. For me, I, I want to get as much as I can out, and then when I feel like I can't do any more on a song, yeah. that's when I'll bring someone else in, usually. Unless it's a specific co-write where, you know, that your publishing person is like, I want to get you together with this person. And you're like, okay, cool, <laughs> let's do it, you know? That happens sometimes, but I think, for the most part, it's me trying to get my own process out onto paper for someone else to experience. And a lot of times, it... It's going to be strong language, but it cheapens the experience that I'm trying to convey to the listener to bring in Moose or whoever who's not actually familiar with what happened in my life or the revelation that I'm specifically singing or speaking about. When he comes in, all of a sudden it's not as pure, quote unquote, and again, that's strong language, but you get what I'm saying. I won't actually ask for help until I'm stuck, like stuck, stuck. And I've worked on a song for like two years, and then finally I was like, okay, I can't get any further. Like, I'm calling in the troops. Like, with, actually, with that song that we did last night, with that song Egypt, You Stepped Into My Egypt, that song came about two years ago, and it was this beautiful kind of expressive, uh, just worshipful time where actually our pastor, Lee, who spoke last night, he came up and he was referencing kind of a time in our lives and, and Caleb and Rachel's lives. Um, and he was talking about basically how he did our own personal exodus. He stepped into our Egypt, and he kind of screamed that phrase. He's like, you stepped into our Egypt, you blah, 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 you, you know, you took off the chains, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like, that's it. So I took that phrase, started working on it, working on it, working on it, had a few ideas, got as far as I possibly could, and literally waited like a year and a half to bring anyone else in, and then I just started calling everyone that I knew who was awesome, which is like, dude, I need your help, like, I can't get any further on this song, and then thankfully, a lot of them helped, you know, and it's landed where it's at, I don't think it's fully there or landed, but I think it's pretty solid right now, but I love just pushing the envelope and, and getting as much out as you possibly can before calling in the troops, and, and again, that's personal for me. A lot of people are like, well, I prefer co-writing because, you know, it just works better for me. I prefer to write alone because it just works better for me. That's just how I am. Um, and maybe that's because I'm a terrible person and I don't like community. Or, you know, <laughs> I'm just selfish and I also want all the money and, like, you know, I'm kidding, obviously. I think it's just how I operate. I feel that the lyrics are pure when they come from here and not here. That's just me. If there's a corporate song talking about holy, 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 you're worthy, we can all relate to that, right? Like, we all know God is holy, God is incredible, He's worthy, <coughs> blessing, honor, glory, power, everything that's in the scripture, we all know that. But there are some songs that are so deeply personal, like I imagine John Mark trying to, you know, bring how he loves to some random dude that his publishing wanted him to hook up with. I don't imagine it would have been the same song. Um, I imagine, you know, some of the lyrics may have gotten uh, trampled on just a touch to sort of land at something that was commercially acceptable. Wow. And for me, I want it to be as pure as humanly possible with relation to what I'm actually experiencing. And that doesn't mean that co-writing is bad, because I love what, what Jonathan is saying. You know, co-writing is gorgeous, and there's something to unity. 
but there's also something to getting your experience processed in your own mind and your own heart with God and sort of getting it out in a way that's actually accessible to people. There's something really sweet about that. Mm-hmm. So you're saying do both? Absolutely. Okay, do both. Yeah. Which is better? <laughs> yeah. so yes. Which one will be the other one? Stealing your wife's songs, that's the better part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I don't have anything to add. That was really good. Next question? Sarah? Yeah, we got a couple. I'm sorry. I've, I've got a question back here. I can't see you. Sure. Oh, there you are. I got you. Uh, my name is Dean. I live right here in Portage. And nice. Dean. Radiant Portage. Killer. Uh... Anyway, as you can see from the gray hair on my head, I'm a little older than, uh, than a lot of people in here, but I'm just wondering in terms of uh, some of the previous artists, that uh, how much do you guys listen to them, like Randy Stonehill, Phil Cavey, uh, Michael Carr, uh, mm. some Petra, yeah. how much of that influences <laughs> any of the music today? Uh, you know, because, well, I've been around a while, but... Uh, like messages, like our messages, just as important as worship melodies in your songs. I mean, like some of these got like well, like Rich Mullins, mm-hmm. like a lot of the great stuff he wrote. Do you want to put forth a message? Mm-hmm. And well, just basically, do you want to put forth a message in a lot of your songs? But also, how much do you go back to the roots of some of those uh, musicians? Yes, yeah. thank you. I don't think we any any of us would even be in this room if it wasn't for some of those guys. Yeah. I mean, Kevin Prost is another one, and like Keith Green. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I I still listen to some of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think we can stop listening to them. I have a Line Six deal for delay pedal signed by Phil Kiggy, so. <laughs> 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 that's, pretty that's, awesome. that's, a hit. that's a great question, I man. I mean, I think all of us have been influenced by many of those uh, different artists and writers that you named off. Yeah. Michael Card, his voice was kind of weird, but I really love a lot of his songs. My wife, like, adores Michael Card. Um, Rich Mullins, massive, huge influence in my life. I think I reference him probably every teaching that I've ever done, that I've ever taught, ever. Um, he's massively uh, inspirational to me. I mean, even Reckless Love, he, he was using that word far before I was. Him and his boy, Brennan Manning, like, that was that was kind of their, their deal, and I just sort of ripped it off and then, you know, capitalized on it. <laughs> uh, you get what I'm saying? I think um, those guys that came before us are brilliant, and to speak to your uh, messaging question, that is all I care about. I don't care about a good song, I don't care about a good melody, I don't care about a great lyric, I care about a message. I care about something that's going to change people. I, th- I care about something that's going to shift, again, the idea of Jesus to an entire generation. That's all I'm thinking of in music. And for me, it's very difficult to settle. And if I don't think that the song is going to change someone's mind about God or direct them in a, in a way that they've not experienced before, I'll usually just trash the idea or the song because... I feel like the, the mandate on my life, and hopefully this, this house's life, is, is again to give new language and new ideas to, to who God is. The messaging aspect is everything. That's all we care about, um, to, to show people who God is, that, that he's maybe different than we've experienced before. And that's a lot of what Rich was about. And I love him. He, if you guys know his story, like he had a couple of really massive songs. Awesome God was a freaking massive song. In fact, I love Rich for it because he started opening his uh, sets with Awesome God because he just wanted to get out of the way so he could get to his other stuff. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Um, but he, he lived off what was an average man's salary. He submitted all of his royalties, all of his money, all of his income to his church and his board of basically elders and said, I don't want you to give me any more than a blue-collar worker in America makes, and he goes, and I never want to know how much I would have made. I simply want you to give me whatever the mean salary for whatever year it was, and I'll live on that. And that's all he cared about. And he, he poured out to the indigenous people of, uh, you know, Nevada and all these places, Native Americans, and he taught them how to, how to sing and how to worship, how to play their instruments, and that heart to me is absolutely beautiful. That's the stuff that I care about.
It's awesome. Is uh, is loving people who are unlovable or unworthy of love. Those those are the messages and the things so that good. that we're about. So I'm hugely inspired by many of those guys and and M Dubs. Don't forget him, man. Michael Dubs. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. That dude is the man. Like he he's incredible, and I think those guys paved so much of the way for us um, in worship music. Even and we're kind of walking in what they've cleared out for us. I think. We probably have time for one more. Yeah, dang. Where is it coming from? Oh. How you guys doing? My name is Breno. I'm originally from Sturgis, Michigan, like 40 minutes south. But I actually go to a, a Bible school in Rochester. Nice. Uh, Zach Hensley, he's my head pastor. Oh, nice. He's how I jumped at New Hope. Nice. Um, so as a young worship leader and just a writer, I always think, like, how can I impact Christians around me, but also my friends who are in the secular world who may not be walking with God, how can I still make an impact? And always that, that question is always on my mind, how do I balance, you know, seeking God to write music, but to also be relevant to the culture, looking at the culture, like the like the secular music, right, who they are just as a people, and how can I use that to still make an impact, but to still show Jesus in my life? Yeah. Good question, man. That's really I think good we all uh, we all wrestle with that that idea of relevance and how do we speak to this generation? How do we speak to the lost that might not be coming to church on a Sunday or a Saturday night? Those are massive questions. Um, and for me, it's I, I never want to compromise a message. I never want to dumb down a message to the culture. And also, I love what P. Lee talked about last night, talking about you know basically so much of Christian music has become become copycat. Yep. And what happens is you end up five years behind because you're trying to copy Coldplay from 2012. Yep. You know, <laughs> every Christian music has that. You know? And what we don't want to do is become that copycat culture. I think you always want to be asking God what he's doing and saying and trying to follow that. However, I think a message can transcend lines that can transcend boundary lines it can transcend gender lines it can transcend uh, race lines you know all those things I'm looking at a girl like Lauren Daigle who I don't believe she's compromised her message I think a lot of Christians would be annoyed with her and are annoyed with her however speaking from personal experience I can tell you that she's a solid girl she loves God loves Jesus and loves the Holy Spirit and is fully sold out to um, all of those uh, people and ideas and her music still is crossing lines yeah. you know I heard the other night I was watching football and her uh, you say came on like Chicago PD like the friggin trailer or something I was like wait a sec like, what is this like, <laughs> and I don't believe she had to dumb down her message I don't believe she had to compromise yeah. who she was I don't think she had to dress differently I don't think she had to act differently God just went hey I'd love to breathe on this Guess why? Because I care about the lost sheep. Yep. Guess why? Because I want to bring them home. And I think he finds ways to do that. And I think there are songs that have done that um, in the past few years as well. That uh, the Lord just said, I'm going to breathe on this. And I'm going, to, I'm going to touch a generation because I care about a generation. I'm also thinking of songs that are, that are suited for TV and film that might not ever say, like, Jesus is God. <laughs> In them, but there's a massively beautiful uh, message in <laughs> every Christian song has to have Jesus as God. His divinity has to be somewhere in there. <laughs> he is the only way. You know, I'm thinking of songs that speak to um, human nature, that speak to our innate weakness, our innate brokenness, speak to uh, death in a family. And somehow direct people to the glory and beauty of God without saying, hey, a family member died, look at God. Yeah. We find ways to craft language and to craft songs that can touch those type of people that, you know, it might end up in Chicago PD. It might end up in, you know, I know, um, you guys have ever heard of Sleeping at Last? Yes. Yeah, okay, so some Sleeping at Last lovers. <laughs> that dude, Ryan, he loves God. Loves the heck out of God, man. And writes really gorgeous songs that have the basis of the knowledge of God. Yeah. However, don't necessarily um, explicitly speak to Jesus as God or, or whatever. But they touch people in a really beautiful way. And then they might get touched by that song and go, who the heck is this guy? And they look him up and go, oh my gosh, he's a believer and he, he thinks this and this and this. 
they start following that trail and it, they end up saved, you know? It's, it's stuff like that that the Lord uses um, because he's so much more jealous for this generation than we are. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what we can fall back on. He wants to save people so much more than we do. So, yeah. He wants those lost sheep home. He wants those prodigals home that's good. so much more than we do. So we're just faithful to write what he gives us. We're faithful to pen the things that he speaks to us. And I think, you know, he uses those weak words. He uses those broken ideas, and, and people end up getting saved that otherwise wouldn't have gotten saved. And you didn't have to say, Jesus is God. Jesus is the only way to the Father. And That's not to say that those things aren't good to say. I like saying those things. <laughs> My point is you don't have to say that to, uh, to have God work in that situation, yeah. you know. And I don't know if that necessarily answered your question exactly. But... Yeah, something? <coughs> yeah. I... I think also thinking about like outside of because you can write worship songs, but there's also songs that are that are probably a lot of you will like uh, some of you know, might not be called to write worship songs or songs for the church. Some of you might be like, I'm a songwriter that I just love writing reggae or I love writing hip hop or I love writing you know country music, um, whatever whatever genre you're in, and like you actually can have great impact. Like I I met. A, and it doesn't have to be like the most popular a guy that I met in New Zealand. His name is Strawn. He's actually really popular in the U.S. But he travels with Josh Gerrels and he, you know, plays at bars and he's like out of the way places that these people never would go to a church a lot of times. But they go to the bar to hear him play. And he's got testimonies like, I'm blown away by it. He's like, I was, this guy emailed him and told me he was in a bar. He sang this song and the guy was like suicidal and was going to commit suicide that night and didn't commit suicide because of a song that this guy is strong saying that gave him hope, you know? And so, like, to realize that it's not only in the church, but some of the songs that you guys will be writing will be outside of the church and will have great impact. And really, it's the Spirit of God on you being communicated through your music that's going to impact people and the message that you're, that you're declaring. And it doesn't always have to be the divinity of Jesus or, you know, the atonement. It could be, you know, just the reality of hope or the reality of of human value and yeah. dignity. You know what I mean? Like, we need songs like that. Those are songs that are the biblical truths, but something like that can impact the culture and actually shift things in a huge way, if, even if it gets outside the church. So, yeah. hope that answers. That's awesome. Is that it? We're Amen. done. Love y'all. Love you. <laughs> Great.